Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We are so glad to have you here for our next master lecture with Earl Lawrence from the FAA. It's my pleasure once again to introduce founder and CEO of GoFly, Gwen Leiter. Thank you, Nitty, And thank you all for joining us today for this master lecture. As you all know, GoFly's grand sponsor is Boeing. And we are joined by additional corporate sponsors, including Pratt & Whitney and our in-kind sponsors to help you with all of your services and needs. So too, we are joined by a group of over 20 different international aerospace organization partners. And today we are thrilled to be able to welcome Earl Lawrence to give our master lecture. Earl Lawrence is the executive director of the UAS Integration Office and is responsible for the facilitation of all regulations, policies, and procedures required to support the FAA's US, UAS integration efforts. He also represents the FAA on the senior steering group of the UAS Executive Committee, focusing on coordination and alignment of efforts among key federal government agencies. Earl previously served as manager of the FAA's Small Airplane Directorate and was the designated executive focal for unmanned aircraft systems within the Aircraft Certification Service. Prior to joining the FAA, Earl was the Vice President of Industry and Regulatory Affairs for the Experimental Aircraft Association, one of our organizational partners. He has also worked for Rocket, Rockwell Rocketdyne, first as a rocket engine mechanic and then as a manufacturing engineer on the International Space Station. Earl has served as a board member of the Light Aircraft Manufacturers Association and on the ASTM International Board of Directors and was the founding chairman of the ASTM International Committee F-37 on Light Sport Aircraft. He received the 2003 Robert J. Painter Memorial Award for the Standards Engineering Society for his standards work for light sport aircraft. Earl holds a commercial multi-engine pilot certificate as well as an airframe and power plant mechanic certificate with an inspection authorization. He is a graduate of Northrop University in Los Angeles and today we are so pleased to welcome Earl Lawrence to give this master lecture. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Earl, and thank you. All right, great to be here as we transition uh, slides here real quickly. So, well, there we go. We'll share. All right, well, Great to be talking to all of you today. Um, it's a real privilege to uh, see what everybody has been developing for this GoFly uh, activity. It's been wonderful, Gwen, to watch her and this organization evolve over the last few years. Um, it's, it's just tremendous work and it's a great vision and it's really neat to see this all coming together with the uh, 10 finalists now. Um, just wanted to cover uh, some basic things. I'm gonna start off um, kind of giving an overview of a little bit of how FAA thinks when you bring things to us. That'll give you an, uh, some insight when you're dealing with it, and then we'll give the various options that are available to you to get flying um, for this competition and even for testing and developing for the competition. So if we can, if I can get this to work. So our regulatory environment. I want to talk about one of the things that I love to talk about is our three A's of flying because it simplifies to the greatest extent as we can what's involved in getting up in the air and dealing with the regulatory environment. And it's really three key things as it says up here. It's the aircraft, the airspace, and the airmen. And when I say airmen, you know, if it's a unmanned aircraft, there's still somebody responsible for that operation. And as you see, as I go into each one of these, um, what I mean for it and each category. All and dealing with all three of those, the focus of the FAA is always about dealing with the risk to non-participant and participating people and property. Um, we're not really that concerned about somebody with an experimental aircraft crashing. Our concern is making sure that that aircraft doesn't harm any non-participant or run into any other aircraft or run into a building or and affect somebody else. It's really about lowering the level of risk um, 
to to the extent possible. Um, we know things aren't perfect. If things were perfect, we wouldn't be flying. So obviously, it's about managing the risk that a particular operation poses and reducing that risk to the lowest level practical uh, for where that operation takes place. So obviously, out in the desert, um, uh, we're willing to allow a little bit more uh, risk because there aren't very many non-participating people or property around to run into or to affect uh, versus an operation in downtown home hometown and obviously that affects things and obviously the size of the aircraft the number of people involved all those things are factors but you can always sum it up what FAA is looking for is not so much your business case but the the, the risk case we want you to show us how are you going to conduct this operation so it doesn't negatively affect anyone else? So how do we do that? Um, we really do focus on hazard identification. What are some of the hazards? Um, I already mentioned them. What's the things that, uh, it, the likelihood of you maintaining control of the aircraft? Um, when I say control of the aircraft, if you're sitting in the aircraft, you've got controls. Um, you can move them around. If you're not sitting in the aircraft, maybe you have a computer that is running it. How good? Is that computer link? What does the software look like? Um, you know, these are the kind of things we're asking you to think about because we want you to show that you're maintaining control of your aircraft and that you have the mechanisms necessary. And if you lose control of your aircraft, where is it going to go? What's going to happen to it? Um, and, and let's mitigate those things. So um, when we look at a particular hazard, the next thing is how big of a hazard is it? Um, as I mentioned, that can change um, based on location. And it, what it says here is severity and likelihood. Um, you know, what's the likelihood of that bad thing happening? It may be a very small likelihood, in which case, um, you know, you don't have to take as many mitigations to prevent it. Um, but we do want you to develop mitigations to reduce the, the various risks that you've identified. And it may sound like we don't, you know, people ask us, well, why don't you just tell us what the risks are? Well, you know your equipment, you know what you're developing, you know the technology behind it, you know where you're gonna operate it, and we're asking you to put on your safety hat and simply think about, geez, if through this operation, what do I care about my machine? What do I care about the, my pilot? What do I care about the people who are participating in this activity? Ask those safety questions and how am I protecting them in that environment? It's to get you into that safety thinking. Um, and when you do that, you'll find it is a lot easier to approach us um, with whatever rule or method you decide to um, go into a, a, go into the project. So as far as options, um, there's lots of paths to, to fly, and I understand the teams are looking at various methods. And this slide is really separated into two parts. It's, it's sort of the manned and the unmanned operation. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to get in the air, and each have a little different set of rules with each one of those. So let's start with 107. Um, we have uh, part 107, which many of you are aware was the first rule that dealt with unmanned aircraft operations. And so if you want to, maybe you're just going to test your machine, or maybe you're going to be in the, in the competition, but if you want to do it unmanned and it weighs less than 55 pounds, 107 is an option for you. Um, you can operate it uh, under 400 feet in Class G airspace today, or you can receive a waiver and exemption if you're um, operating um, in other airspaces. So um, you may be in a remote area, but it happens to be in um, an airspace that was designated for an airport. Um, we have what we call our LANT uh, system now. You may be able to get an automatic approval within uh, within LANT, which is a a third party provided electronic approval, um, those can happen in seconds. Um, or you can just move out into G airspace away from people and property. Um, and then you can operate below 400 feet as long as you're less than 100 miles an hour. Um, and that you're, you're doing the operation within the visual line of sight of the person who is controlling the aircraft. And, and I want to highlight that a little bit too. That you can get waivers to it, but really what visual line of sight is it is it, it you know some people think it's all about I can see the aircraft so I know where to move it up or down and they don't think about the other half of that it's really that I'm standing next to the aircraft and I can look out in the sky and look around to see if there's another aircraft coming in whether that be an unmanned aircraft or a manned aircraft 
that may be flying into that area because it's your responsibility to avoid and not pose a hazard to those other aircraft. Um, so don't forget about that. If you're looking to do a beyond visual line of sight waiver or go a little bit further, um, you can bring those things into us under um, uh, Part 107, but we're really going to be saying, how do you know where your aircraft is and how are you going to make sure there aren't other aircraft in the area or you're avoiding those other aircraft in the area? That's really a, a big part of the visual line of sight, not just about controlling the aircraft itself. Um, I bring that up because some people use uh, a first-person view. Um, and again, first-person view does not um, give you that peripheral vision of everything that's happening in the area. And you got to remember to address that. And, and that's really what the focus of the visual line of sight is. It is fly during the day, um, although we do have some waivers for night. But I would think for most of your experiments and for the competition, it will be during the day. Um, and it's no operations over people. And again, that's to protect those non-participants um, in case something goes wrong. Then uh, another way um, that's very low regulatory touch is to go part 103. Um, so part 103 means an individual will be on board the aircraft. And, and again, you could maybe do a part 107 test and do it remotely piloted. And then after you have those initial tests, um, you may want to move on to part 103 and, and put somebody on board. Um, those aircraft are allowed to be a little bit larger. You can uh, go up to 254 pounds um, on those aircraft. And there's a few other uh, pieces of safety equipment that allows you to go larger. If you're an amphibious aircraft, you can go a little bit larger than 254 pounds. Um, but again, all these are detailed in, in the rules itself. But it is a manned operation. It is a single occupant uh, operation. And it has similar rules to Part 107. No flights over people. Um, you, you need to avoid congested areas so you're not flying over people on property and uh, near um, busy uh, intersections as far as aircraft and operation. Um, so it's really a very similar thing to 107. Go out in the countryside, uh, it gives you an opportunity to fly it. And with 103, um, I should back up with 107, you need to have a pilot certificate. That's a 107 pilot certificate. With 103, you don't need an airworthiness approval for the aircraft, and you don't need a pilot certificate. So those are big things. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, you just have to meet the requirements of the aircraft of being less than 254 pounds, and also meet some of the fuel requirements. You can, uh, if you're electric, um, you won't have those concerns. If you're going to be a gasoline powered, it needs to be five gallons or, or less. Um, and then I'd like to move over to uh, 333 exemptions. These are um, available for a limited amount of time now. Um, there was a, a bill that Congress just passed in the last few days, and it was just signed in by the, admin, uh, by the president, um, that actually will do away with the 333 exemptions after 2020. Um, but it does still exist until uh, through 2020, um, and that allows you to, if you do not have, a, if you've got an unmanned aircraft um, and you're not looking to get an experimental certificate for what, what we'll talk about it in a little bit, and it's larger than a Part 107 aircraft, it's over 55 pounds, uh, you can come in and bring us in some information about that aircraft. It is still uh, we, an airworthiness approval, so we're still looking for design data. We're looking for how reliable it is, how strong it is, um, and if you were to fly under uh, 333, similar to experimental, um, the pilot requirements will have to be dealt with, um, typically a, a Part 61 certificate. And when I say pilot, that could be the remote pilot on the ground or it could be somebody on the aircraft. Um, and you will still need a separate airspace approval under 333. So you don't need a separate approval uh, for airspace under 103. You don't need a separate airspace approval if you stay within the approved areas in 107. You will need a specific COA. Um, uh, uh, under Section 333. And of course, the most uh, uh, the flexible, I call it the most flexible, but it's also the most rigorous, is getting an experimental special air within a certificate. Um, these really are for experiments. We understand you're doing an experiment, and it's important when you come in uh, for these certificates that uh, you explain what you're doing with your experiment and where you want to operate it. And we'll get into that in a little bit more depth. But it, it does allow, uh, there's no weight limit, there's no size limit, um, 
but you do fall into our regular pilot requirements where you will need somebody, whether they're a remote pilot or whether they're a pilot on the aircraft, will we'll need a, a pilot part 61 pilot certificate, meaning not a not a uh, remote pilot certificate, but a private pilot, a light sport, one of the existing pilot certificates. Um, so, you know, there's pluses and minuses in each one of these things. Um, I know we're going to have questions and, and answers later, and we can get into a little bit more depth, but I wanted to give you an idea of there's at least four paths for all of you to go down. And I know you could use multiple of these. You may use one path for the competition and another one uh, for testing. So they're all open to you and they're all uh, available for your for your use. And we, in the end, I'll have contacts and additional information to help you uh, with each one of those. So let's go into it a little bit more. Um, small UAS rule, part 107, just to really highlight, aircraft going to be less than 55 pounds. You're going to operate in G airspace, visual line of sight, and you're going to need a remote pilot certificate. If you go 103, um, it's going to be less than 254 pounds. It's going to have one seat. Um, and as I mentioned, five gallons. And also, your max airspeed is going to be 55 knots. The airspace is daylight um, or civil twilight only, and no ops over people or congested areas. The airmen, no aeronautical knowledge, age, or experience requirements, so very flexible in 103. If we go experimental special airworthiness certificate, again, the aircraft will have an airworthiness certificate. The airspace you operate in will need an, an, uh, an authorization from uh, our uh, air traffic folks, and we'll get into how that you might do that. And the airmen will have to have that Part 61 certificate that I mentioned. So those are the traditional uh, light sport or private pilot, commercial pilot uh, certificate. So let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, flight test areas and, and how you get those. Um, some people think they're they're kind of magical, but but they really aren't. Um, if you're operating um, 107 or 103, you're going to simply be looking for areas in the map that, uh, as I mentioned, the G airspace or the uncongested airspace. And you may ask, well, what, what's congested or uncongested? There, there, there's not a set definition, but a good um, uh, way to to when you look at a sectional, we got a picture here of a, a of an FAA a, a chart here. The yellow areas are generally considered congested areas, just to give you a, a, an idea. So you want to stay outside of those yellow areas. And you'll see a little red box up there um, on that chart. And it gives you, you an idea of, of here's a test area. Um, so when you apply for an experimental certificate or a, if you're going to get a certificate of authorization for airspace, you're literally going to take a section and you're going to draw a picture like that on there. You're going to tell us, here's the ad airspace. Now, I, I encourage you not just to say, here's a great area, look at all the things that are going on in those areas. You see this map, it's got all these little different symbols and everything going on in there. Um, and right next to it is what we call a VOR, a navigation aid. Um, and you'll see little lines, and I don't know if you can see my, my uh, pointer here. You'll see lines going up and down here, and they got like uh, 0, 29 degrees and 145 degrees, and that says, B273, those are flyways. People are actually, think of those as a highway in the sky, actually flying on those. So you, you're, you're going to be looking to avoid those specifically. Um, you'll also see, you know, different, obviously the yellow, you want to be avoiding the yellow in the cities. And, um, it, you know, look at these sometimes. They're over here. This map also has what's called a restricted area on it. So it, it, it's got uh, restricted airspace that the military may have restricted. or You'll see a little parachute there. Somebody's doing parachute jumping. You want to avoid those those kind of things. So you're looking for an area that doesn't have a whole lot of other operations in it. Um, sometimes there's environmental concerns, and these are on the map. They actually have uh, little dotted lines in there, and they'll say, um, you know, it's a condor reserve area. Please stay away from there, and and you know, fly above a certain altitude. So obviously, you're going to want to you know stay away from those types of of places. But it, this is a conversation putting it down on a map and describing your area to, to and, and but study up and, and find an area. Again, the objective here, go back to that risk mitigation, is you're trying to protect non-participating people on property. It's not about you, um, although we don't want you to be hurt either, um, but uh, 
what, what we're evaluating from a risk standpoint uh, is other, the, the effect of your experiment and your testing to others. So um, you, we also have that the Section 333 exemption. Um, and when we're looking at Section 333 exemption, just to repeat it again, um, the aircraft is actually getting an approval in, in essence. So if you, you look at the act, the, the law that created the FAA actually requires us, uh, unless we're exempted, and, and this, this law gave us an exemption, um, we're actually required to, to put a, a certificate on every aircraft and put a certificate on every pilot. Um, so you, you have to, that actually, that's, that's our job that Congress told us we have to do that, except when they give us exemptions. Um, 333 was one of those exemptions. Um, but 333 did still also say that we're supposed to evaluate that aircraft uh, for safety. So it's not a blanket, um, we can just issue it to you, um, where, believe it or not, on an experimental, we're issuing a certificate, but we're not actually evaluating an experimental aircraft um, for its safety. We're evaluating your project to make sure that, that in essence, unsafe operation stays away from everybody else. Um, you know, that sounds kind of funny. It may be a very safe aircraft, but um, we're focused on protecting others from, from that experiment. On a Section 333, we're still evaluating the aircraft that it meets a certain level of safety and then adjusting the airspace and the airmen uh, requirements based on how safe that may be. So examples of things we've, we've had folks bring in under Section 333 larger aircraft to us. Um, very heavy aircraft, but they may have been used in the military previously, or they may have been used overseas and have thousands of hours of testing and operation. Those are really good candidates because in, in a way, it's what we call a pedigree. It comes with data and information um, on the safety of that operation. Um, otherwise, probably experimental if you're larger than, than 55 and not under 107 or 103 would, would be your path. So, um, I, and, and I know the, the good part of this presentation is going to be getting into all these questions and answers, but just to, to back, you know, to kind of review this a little bit, um, utilize your resources um, that you have and, and think about what are the risks that you may be exposing folks to and, and how are you going to assure that those non-participants are going to be protect, uh, uh, protected. Um, I mentioned when you look at those section, sectionals, come prepared, read those things. And then I'm going to give you some more reference here. When I say come prepared, read our internal rules and regs and, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, and our procedures ahead of time. And I'm going to give you those links and, and you're going to have those. I can't have, uh, highlight enough when I was at the Experimental Aircraft Association, um, I, I felt it was always my job to actually know the experimental rules better than the FAA. And when you come in and you know the rules better than we do, and you can even correct us of, no, that's not what the policy says, it says this. We actually welcome that. It's a, it's a great opportunity. We love people who come in who have read everything ahead of time and, and, and are ready. And so we always say, bring us the safety case, not the business case. We're really not, um, it's not our role. I, we, we find it interesting sometimes, and it's nice to have discussions, but it, your business case isn't what we're judging. We're looking at protecting the non-participating people and property. So you get the theme. I keep saying it over and over again. So what are some of their resources? I know I, I kind of just skimmed over it, and you're going to have a ton of questions, and we're going to need a whole lot of work on on each one of these options and what they might be, what options may be best for you. Um, so what we've done here is we provided some links and some individuals, specific people in the FAA that are ready to talk to you. Uh, they know about GoFly. Um, they are expecting your your phone calls and your your emails and your inquiries, um, and they're ready to help walk you through the, your specific project. Because as you can tell, it's going to vary on your specific project and your particular aircraft. What might be the best path for you? So as you can see, just as Part 107 is an example, uh, uh, Mark Guyron, um, and it, it provides his email address there. Um, and, you know, go read the 14 CFR, Code of Federal Regu Regulations, Part 107, the Small Unmanned Aircraft Systems Rule, and, and then we have a link there of a website where you can learn a whole bunch more. Um, let's drop down, you know, experimental, you'll see Brian Cable, 
uh, down there and his his name and you'll see uh, first an order listed um, and that first order is for um, unmanned experimental aircraft and then there's also another order that's available if you're going to go manned so that there are a little bit different requirements whether it's going to be manned or, or unmanned and you'll also see an advisory circular there that gives you a wealth of information of what do you need to bring in to the FAA when you're going to be applying for an experimental certificate. And then again, you see the rules there. So uh, you get the theme, it's probably gonna be, you're either gonna be dealing with Brian or Mark, um, and they're standing by to assist you and an answer additional questions. And really at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions because I, I threw a whole bunch of stuff out there and I'm really curious to know your specifics and how I might help you with guiding you through um, the four different paths that you have uh, available to you as you you develop your uh, your aircraft and and go into the competition. Thank you so much, Earl. That was incredibly informative. Um, so the first question that we have is: How does the stall speed requirement of Part One Hundred Three apply to VTOL aircraft? Okay, so for for VTOL aircraft, it doesn't apply. That's the beauty of the stall speed. So if you're a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Um, you don't, that the stall speed uh, does not. So we do in 103 have vertical takeoff. We have helicopter operations in part 103. Um, so basically your, your stall speed in, in one way, I know it depends on whether you want to really get dirty or not, um, but in one way you don't really have a stall speed because you can hover. So um, I, I know a, a true stall speed has to do with the aerodynamics over the airfoil and all that kind of stuff, but um, uh, you, you don't have to worry that. If you're a vertical lift, um, that's not a concern. Thank you, Earl. Uh, next question is, I got a special airworthiness certificate in my home country that allowed me to do my testing and practice flying there. What additional steps will I need to take to be able to fly at the fly-off? Okay, so at the fly-off, um, that's a really good question. So at the fly-off, um, what, um, what I'm envisioning, um, we still have to work through work some, uh, uh, some procedures with GoFly as well, but we're envisioning to run it like an air show. So it's an, what we call an aviation event. So it will have an aviation event waiver. Um, and if you're bringing it in with a foreign approval, um, then what we will be looking for is, is a couple of choices. You could bring it in and you, depending on one of these categories, could be operating it as a U.S. aircraft, or you could be operating in it as an aircraft from the country you're bringing it from. Um, and so typically what we're looking for is, I'm just going to, I'm just going to make up something. So it's coming from Europe, say it's a French aircraft, we're looking for a French registration on the aircraft. So the French Airworthiness Certificate and the information that you have based on that, you know, operating limitations on it. And the operator of the aircraft is gonna have to have a French certificate. So it's sort of, uh, if you're going to be French, you gotta be all French. The aircraft and the pilot and the operation, and you bring it over and uh, you will get a special authorization for the event, um, but you have to, again, meet all those requirements. You can't be partial, you can't be, you know, bring over a French aircraft and then have a U.S. pilot on it. It's got to be, you, you have to stay 100% um, that country, um, so to speak. Um, so, so that is a definitely an option. And again, we will, um, that would be with the coordinator for the actual event. Um, what, what we'll have is a national air show, is what we call a national air show uh, coordinator. Um, I know it's not an air show, it's, a, uh, it's an event, but, but um, that's just the title of that, that individual. Um, and Mark Guyron, um, he's in that office. He's not the, the that coordinator, but he'll be able to coordinate that um, for you. Or again, you can contact me and we'll make sure we deal with your specific issue. But when you bring that package forward, we're gonna need to know all about the approval in the country you're operating. Um, if you have no approval from that country, um, and I, I, I bring that up because it could be, um, you know, Africa or something where they didn't issue a, an approval for the aircraft or the pilot, um, you're going to need some type of approval. We, we can't work on no approval, but we can certainly, we have international agreements to and procedures to accept if that country did give an approval for that aircraft. Great question. Um, Earl, under part 103, is there a battery weight limit for electric powered aircraft? 
So um, unfortunately, when they wrote 103, we, we the there was no vision of batteries, <laughs> um, and so the 254 pounds is the 254 pounds. Period. Um, so your your batteries can weigh as much as they want, but the whole overall aircraft still has to meet the 254 pound limit. And 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 I I can hear people now of like, well, if I'm gas, I get to have add the weight of the gasoline on top of that. Not so with electric. Um, I, 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 that would re require a whole separate regulatory authority to do so. Um, and I would think uh, in the time frame you have, it's unlikely to occur. You could certainly apply. Um, uh, others have applied in the past. Um, EAA has applied others, and they've been denied. Um, so uh, right now, if you're going to go Part 107, just look at 254 is your weight, including your batteries. Um, otherwise, look to move on to an experimental certificate. Okay. Um, and how many meetings with the FAA would it typically take to secure an approval in each class, um, assuming the team has studied and prepared well? Um, it, it, it could be one meeting if you're really prepared. Um, and and, and I, I, that's not an exaggeration. I've seen that happen uh, multiple times. Um, but um, again, it, it, it is the key thing there is, is very well prepared ahead of time. But think of it this way. I think it's going to be a couple of phone calls ahead of time um, and then bringing in your package, doing a face-to-face -face visit. Um, and if you're going to need a airworthiness certificate issued, so if it's not a, uh, a well, 107 is going to be the easiest. If it's going to be 333, um, that's going to have to go in like an exemption package. So uh, you're going to have to formally submit uh, a package of information to us. Uh, if it's experimental, we're going to go out and actually visit the aircraft and, and look at it and make sure, um, do a what we call a general airworthiness uh, certificate. We're going to look at your safety uh, study for the airspace you're going to operate in. Um, and so that will probably take a couple of meetings. And then, of course, Part 103 doesn't require any meetings. Um, you can just operate the aircraft as long as you stay within the Part 103 definition. Again, that's only for manned operation. Okay. And how do approvals apply if I need to make necessary changes during the testing or fly-off? Ah, that great stuff. So changes are expected in, in, in most of these categories. Um, obviously, uh, 103. You don't have to tell us about them. Um, experimental, um, that's in your operating limitations. It talks um, in there. So it depends when I say operating limitations. So when you get an experimental certificate, um, there is another piece of paper that says, okay, well, if you make changes to it, this is what you need to do. You know, you need to talk to us or, um, or not. But actually, for most of what everybody's doing here, what we call it is, when you make a change, we put you in what's called phase one operating limitations. That's when we are being the most restrictive about the airspace you operate in. Um, and so you're already there. You're probably going to be in phase one the whole time. So changes will be more of just a notification, um, not any kind of uh, a major uh, approvals or anything like that. So it's not really something we, we, we need to approve as long as you stay in that most restricted phase one of your operating limitations. Um, and exemption under 333, that would be an issue because 333, as I mentioned before, that's more of uh, I have an existing aircraft with a uh, with a, a clear configuration that would require us to start over. Um, and then again, in Part 107, there is no airspace uh, air worthiness approval for the aircraft, so you can make all the changes you want on, under 107. Um, I, I'll just say, and, and, and there's a previous question, and, and, and this question I want to throw out one thing I forgot to say is, you're always better off talking to us early. Um, let us know what's going on. Um, that's one of the things, Gwen, I, I remember she reached out to me, actually it's been uh, quite a few years now, and, and that was so appreciative. It allows us to prepare and help you the most. The earlier we know, um, the more we can accommodate um, whatever way you choose to go. Great. Um, will a flight termination system be required? No. Okay. And I'm going to just, that's easy. It's just, it's <laughs> no. <laughs> Great. Um, now, now, I, now that, that, you know, I'll, I'll, obviously you may want one, 
because it could be a safety mitigation to one of your hazards, okay? But uh, again, that's your choice, but certainly not required. Okay. If I find interested sponsors, would I be able to let them fly my device? Uh, again, that depends on which certificate, that it, which one of these four options you decide to take. So if it's an experimental um, aircraft, it, it, you just have to meet the pilot certificate requirements for that um, particular operation. Um, if you're part 103, don't need a pilot certificate, so that would just be your own procedures within the company and what you considered safe and appropriate. Um, section 333, um, that again, when you reach, get that, that will, as it highlights there, the part 61, um, certificate, so it will you will have to designate a specific certificate um, when you get your, your your approval. So that will be set. And then um, Part 107, you need to have the Part 107 um, operator certificate. Okay, uh, I did my testing and practicing with my UAS at one of the UAS test sites. Um, what additional steps will I need to take to be able to fly at the flyoff? Um, so uh, on that particular case, um, it, it, all of you, let's back up, regardless of where you did your testing or how you did your testing, when it comes to the actual fly-off, that, as I mentioned, you will now be doing that within an aviation event, and you will have to be bringing to that aviation event evidence that you have, you, you won't have to worry about airspace approval, because uh, lucky for you, GoFly will, will be working that out with the FAA. And, and think of the competition as uh, fly-off areas or a test area. So you've got that. But you will have to be able to show how you're in compliance with whichever way. If you're flying at man, that you meet one of the man regulations. If you're uh, unmanned, that you're meeting one of the unmanned regulations. So the appropriate approval on the airframe and the appropriate uh, pilot approvals will, you'll need to bring in. Airspace, you won't have to worry about. Gwen has to worry about that. Okay. Um, so the next question, Earl, is uh, the rules are based on aircraft weight, for example, 254 pounds. This does not take into account the kinetic energy in the rotating machinery. Can I get approval for a heavier aircraft if I can show less energy than approved aircraft, as in higher weight but less kinetic energy? So um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, an opinion. Um, not a regulatory. The opinion is no, <laughs> um, but the regular, and, and I say the different it's in there because from a regular uh, regulatory standpoint, you can get an exemption to do anything. Um, uh, but I want to highlight back, it, it, when you see these weights, um, these weights were not um, necessarily figured out um, on risk base, solely on kinetic energy or anything like that. Um, it, they, they, it, the, the weight in Part 107 was a number that Congress passed. It was simply they passed a law that said FAA doesn't need to require airworthiness certificate for 55 pounds and less, and so that's what we were enabled to do there. So that was actually not a really a safety-based number. It was what the law allowed us to do. Um, Section 333 doesn't have a weight limitation. Experimental doesn't have a weight limitation. Under Part 103, if you go back, that was a long time ago. Again, it wasn't focused so much on, on weight, it was, it, but it was trying to declare a class of aircraft and say they're not aircraft. Um, and that came out of the hang gliding movement of the 70s. Uh, if you remember, um, those not very efficient uh, airfoils used to jump off the cliff with them. And, and some uh, entrepreneurial folks started Get it taking chainsaw motors and, um, and, and attaching them to the frame um, on the stick. It literally chainsaw motors, but a little propeller there and calling them self launch gliders. So instead of having to jump off the cliff, they could, uh, you know, maybe do a small hill or something like that and run along and use that to get them up. And, and that weight was based on covering those aircraft and saying, okay, we don't really want to regulate those aircraft um, like we do normal aircraft, we're going to put them in 103. So I, I bring all that up to give you that basis, but those really weren't safety numbers. And, and so coming in and trying to use that to say, hey, I should be in 103 um, because I have this such and such uh, kinetic energy, 
um, uh, for your purposes for this, it's really going to be the experimental certificate is, is your path if you don't fit into 103. Earl, can you comment on the FAA position on the ballistic recovery system? Okay, so um, ballistic recovery systems are a mitigator, but again, not a required system in any way, but they can certainly assist you in addressing um, risks that you, your operation may pose um, to reduce those risks um, for, the, for the operation. So again, when you're looking at the hazards that um, your operation may pose to others, um, you may want to have it. Um, if it's an unmanned aircraft, you may just want to have it so that you don't have to rebuild your aircraft if something goes wrong. That, that's one of yours. That's not that's your mitigation. That's not so much one of our mitigation. Um, if you're asking under Part 103, um, one of the things that we, we declared for Part 103, the FAA declared, is that you could add a ballistic on that as a manned aircraft, and we would not count that in the weight. Um, and that was for safety reasons. Again, we didn't want to punish folks for adding something on their aircraft that may save their lives. Um, we thought that was uh, a safety equipment and you can, so the 254 pounds does not include the weight of your ballistic system. Um, if you, ballistic parachute, if you want to add that. Um, so again, it all depends on, on what you're doing. Um, if it helps you with a safety mitigation to give you access to a certain airspace, um, then certainly um, that, that's a positive thing. Um, but in no way does FAA require ballistic um, systems for, for any of these aircraft. Okay, thank you so much, Earl. That is all of the question, questions oh, come on. so far. Um, oh, I will, okay. <laughs> I, was gonna say. I will hand it back to Gwen uh, to wrap us up. Well, Earl, thank you so much. And do not worry. I have no doubt that you will be receiving a ton of questions uh, for both Mark and Brian and the entire team. So thank you so very, very much for providing that incredibly valuable information to all of our GoFly teams. Uh, and to all of our teams out there, uh, use this information, use these contacts. Should you have additional questions uh, as you uh, review this lecture, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out to us at GoFly or do not uh, hesitate to reach out to the contacts provided by Earl and his team. And we are so very thankful, Earl, for you joining us today and for explaining uh, the number of different pathways that our GoFly teams can take uh, to achieve success at GoFly and beyond. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. That was pretty easy. Thank you, Earl, that was great.